Thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my brief is to give you a vascular perspective um, on leg ulceration. I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. From a vascular surgeon's point of view, and uh, probably from your point of view, the current management of leg ulceration in the UK is poor. You've all seen this uh, figure from Guest. We did our own little audit uh, over a 10-week period and looked at new leg ulcer referrals coming into my clinic. And 36 ulcers were referred. Only six of them had any evidence of having had their pulses felt or ABPIs done or anything like that. Over 83% of them were being managed without this key assessment. And this is despite them having had, on average, their ulcer being present for over six months at the time of referral. Unsurprisingly, none had had any venous assessment. More worryingly, when we uh, looked at them, none of the patients with venous ulcers, as we diagnosed in our clinic, were having the compression which would have benefited them, very much as we hear. All 36 were having all kinds of very expensive dressings put on, and very worryingly, one patient who hadn't had a pulse taken or had an ABPI was having compression. So that really did throw us. So when they came, we assessed them, of course, we did the ABPIs, they have duplex in the vascular clinic, because that's what we do. And over 90% of them had a vascular cause for their ulcer, hence the vascular surgeon's involvement. And of these, two-thirds had a venous ulcer, which could and should have been treated to remove their ulcer etiology. So how do we treat varicose veins? Well, varicose veins have probably always played humanity, and they're referenced in ancient writings. There have been various theories about why ulcers happen and how we should treat them. And this Roman physician, Claudius Galen, had a very uh, interesting view. He thought that an ulcer was the body's natural opening to get rid of evil biles and that we must not heal ulcers. But we moved on from that. And it wasn't until the late 18th and 19th century that the venous bases of leg ulcers began to be recognized. This was around the same sort of time that the German surgeon, Friedrich Trendelenburg developed his high tie and strip operation that we still use today. Injection sclerotherapy also came around about the same sort of time, um, but liquid sclerotherapy wasn't that effective and in the last century was very rarely used. But with the advent of medical ultrasound in the late uh, 1980s, foam sclerotherapy has come on board with ultrasound guidance and it's much more effective and it's, it's come into use. The sort of techniques I'm going to tell you about in a moment, using lasers and radio frequency, have all come on board since the millennium. This 1996 BJS paper is credited with popularizing the use of venous surgery to treat venous leg ulcers. This paper showed that uh, if you use a duplex to diagnose underlying varicose veins, which in this paper was 50%, and in fact is more so the more you look, you can eliminate the underlying pathophysiology of the leg ulcer and therefore heal it and keep it healed. This led directly to the landmark ESCAR trial, which showed that if you operate on varicose veins in patients with leg ulcers, you halve the recurrence rate. Surgery typically involves tying off the sphenofemoral junction in the groin, stripping out the varicose veins, as those pictures show along the bottom. Um, but this is invasive, it's done under general anaesthetic, uh, it has complications, and it's not suitable for many of our elderly leg ulcer patients. Modern local anaesthetic, walk-in, walk-out, endovenous treatments have changed all that. And these, these are now in use in most uh, centres in the UK. These can be thermal, heat-based, or non-thermal. The thermal ones often use a laser or radio frequency, and the principle of them is to instead of removing the great venous vein, is to close it. And this little animation shows what we do. You put a little sheath in the vein near the knee. You pass a little uh, catheter fiber up to the junction you want to treat, typically the great venous vein. And then when it's there, you put local anesthetic all around it. You fire the machine. And as you pull it out, the heat closes the vein. And in life, infiltrate the skin with local. The patient walks in, infiltrates local anesthetic, and then you put a needle under ultrasound guidance into the vein as is being as I'm doing here. And you can see in the ultrasound picture in the middle, the vein tenting and then the needle enters the vein. And you get blood coming up into the needle near my fingers there. It's called the Seldinger technique. Once you're in, you pass a wire into the vein through the needle, you then take the needle out and you pass your sheath 
over the wire to gain access to the vein. Thereafter, everything that you put in will be in the vein. Once you've got the wire in and to the junction you want to treat, you then want to anesthetize the vein. So we don't anesthetize the leg, just the vein. We inject lots and lots of weak local anesthetic fluid, that dark stuff going in around the vein and the catheter through a long needle, that picture that I'm holding, all under ultrasound guidance. And then once it's in, you fire the machine, and as you pull it out, it generates heat. You can see Steve on the ultrasound image on the right, and the vein closes. In this, in this case, I'm using a radio frequency device. The non-thermal technique, the ones... I just want to wake you up. I wanted to wake you up. Make sure you're all awake. That technique requires those injections. And they need about three or four needle injections, which some people find difficult. These non-thermal techniques don't need that sort of anesthetic. And foam sclerotherapy is the commonest of those, where you mix a sclerosant chemical, usually fibrovein, with air, and you just mix it up, and you make a foam, a bit like bubble bath foam, which you then inject to try to do the same thing, to close the truncal vein. But foam may be even better for leg ulcers because not only can you close the truncal vein, you can also close the veins directly under the ulcer, the so-called sub-ulcer plexus. And the evidence is if you close those, the healing is going to be quicker and much more effective. And here, I've cannulated a whole lot of, there's a medial malleolar ulcer, which actually was bleeding, and I've put lots of needles all around it. And then you inject the foam, and here you can see this is the trunk first being treated, and then when I flick into cross-section, you see this, this sub-ulcer plexus with a the foam there. It find, they find, find its own way, and it's very, very effective. In the few patients whose uh, ulcers are not due to varicose veins, and some of them is due to narrowings or blockages in their main veins in their pelvis, you can these days use a balloon angioplasty or stent to open those up and treat their venous hypertension. So all those treatments have been around for at least 20 years. Uh, but despite that, we're still, as we've heard this morning, not doing very well with the leg ulcer management. Why is that? Well, we've heard leg ulcers are very prevalent in our elderly and aging population. They're poorly assessed, particularly from the vascular sense. And I fully agree with what was said earlier, that actually, if you're an expert working in a multidisciplinary way, you do not need an ABPR on every patient necessarily. Ulcers tend to be treated as simply wounds, just being dressed again and again and again as those patients who came into my clinic uh, were having. If you do this, you have poor healing rates, less than 30% at 24 weeks. And unsurprisingly, the few that do heal are more likely to recur. This leads to a chronic condition where the ulcers are healing and breaking down and healing, breaking, and the patients spend a lot of their lives with an ulcer. This care it's expensive in nursing time, bandaging time, dressings, etc. And it's an estimated that the cost of managing a leg ulcer patient in the UK can be as much as £10,000 a year. This is all compounded by organisational deficiencies. There is no national registration of leg ulcers. We don't know how our public money is being spent out there. People just going in and bandaging and not bandaging correctly, incorrectly. There are variable clinical protocols. There's limited specialist input. And there's no national leadership or structure for this major economic and health problem. A leg ulcer is not a diagnosis in itself. It is being caused by something else. I use the analogy of calling it a weed. And the top, the green bit, is the ulcer. And the roots are the cause. And you've got to get to the roots and treat that root cause. If you don't, the ulcer is less likely to heal. And if it does heal, it's more likely to break down. So how can we approach things differently? Well, we can use guidance. Despite what we've heard, guidelines are not a straitjacket of what you must follow. It's a default starting base from which to launch as a specialist to, to do more individualized care. And this leg, uh, also guidance that we produced from Royal Society of Medicine Venus Forum last November, I think you've all seen, it's on your website. Um, and this is very simple, uncontroversial. It says every patient should have an ABPI measurement attempted. Those who haven't got an arterial ulcer should have compression. They should all be offered a venous duplex can, and those with varicose veins should have their veins treated. Very straightforward from the vascular point of view. That guideline is developed from 
national and international guidance published since 2010, relatively modern, all more or less saying the same thing. And they give advice on assessment, treatment, prevention of recurrence, all of which are key to leg ulcer management. These guidelines are not so good on advising on care provision, a key part of leg ulcer management, because the papers just aren't out there to inform that sort of, that sort of advice. The guidelines use established methodology to grade uh, what we should be doing. Grade A is using good evidence for meta-analyses, systematic reviews, and uh, uh, randomized controlled trials. B is from reviews of non-randomized studies. C is from non-analytic case reports or, or series. And D is opinions from experts like me, which is the worst sort of evidence to go on. They use these and they combine them with the risk benefits and cost assessment to give a recommendation, as a strong recommendation one or a weak recommendation two, for or against a particular intervention. We're going to look at how these apply to what we do. So, in terms of assessment, there is strong recommendation on good evidence that all patients should have an ABPI and a venous duplex to assess the blood supply to and the venous drainage from the affected limb. There's strong recommendation that selective biopsy should be undertaken in ulcers that look suspicious of non-vascular pathology if there's a history of malignancy or if the ulcer remains non-healing despite you having done all the right things. Culture solves much beloved in the community. There is reasonable evidence that you should not do culture swabs, okay? But you should do them selectively if there are signs of spreading infection. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. And for the, the ulcers that look, where there's suspicions of deep venous disease or duplex evidence of that, you should go on to further investigations with a view to intervention. What about treatments? They recommend that we use simple non-toxic solutions such as water to clean the leg ulcer keeping it simple and cost-effective. Surgical debridement is recommended for sloughy ulcers, and there's a weaker <coughs> recommendation for using biological debridement, such as maggots. non adherent dressings are recommended, but antimicrobial dressings are not. There is the strongest evidence for compression, you've just heard this morning, Systemic antibiotics are not recommended except selectively if there is a signs of spreading infection. And there's a recommendation for uh, pinch biopsies of large ulcers simply because you can get them healed quicker. But that's used selectively. What about interventions? Well, there's support for using superficial venous interventions, be it surgical or the ones I've told you about this morning. But that evidence is based on non-analytic C-level recommendations. And in a moment, you'll be hearing about the EVRA trial, which was published on Tuesday. And uh, that trial was set up to back up the evidence base behind what we all feel was the right thing to be doing, because we see our patients healing, but you'll hear whether that, that was the case or not. People with deep venous disease should be treated. What about treatments for preventing ulcers? Compression therapy has good evidence that it should be applied once the ulcer is healed to reduce recurrence. There's very good evidence from the ESCAR trial that superficial venous surgery halves, more than halves, the, the rate of recurrence. Again, for the new endovenous therapies, uh, there's a recommendation, but again, as you can see there, is level C recommendation, and the long-term follow-up of the ESCAR trial again will help us answer that question. And the deep disease, yes. So, in summary for that bit of it, the guidelines currently recommend and support the principle of identifying and treating the underlying cause of a leg ulcer, both to heal it and to reduce the, ch risks of it, the chances of it recurring once healed. <coughs> Care provision, as I've said, is not well addressed by guidance. Uh, this pathway, uh, being a patient being managed in ulcer clinics using pathways like this, lead to better outcomes. The Gloucestershire Leg Ulcer Service is a model that we could all follow. The, every patient is assessed as described. They apply compression, they biopsy selectively, they pinch skin graft, 
and they use, uh, initially they used to use surgery, but now they use foam sclerotherapy to help heal their ulcers. What do they do? Patients are assessed. Those with venous ulcers have bandaging and endovenous ablation. Those with mixed moderate arterial disease and venous ulcers are managed with modified reduced compression by specialist nurses. And those that don't heal, together with arterial ulcers, are referred to the vascular clinic for treatment. Anybody who gets a recurrence gets reassessed and goes through the pathway again. They've got nearly 11,000 leg ulcer patients in their database. And when they've looked at the last 10,000, they found that over 80% of them have venous ulcers, which can be managed in the way I've described. The 24 healing rates reported 20 years ago, when they first set this up, uh, more than doubled. And this has improved further. In the year blocks of 2011, 2014, their healing rates went up to 85%. In their last data, 2015, 16, they've got a 92% healing rate, which is amazing. Recurrence has reflected this. The recurrent rates more than halved in their early reports. And again, looking at these kaplan meier curves, the recurrence has reduced to 11% in that first period and to 6% in the last period. All this saves money. They worked out using the original data. They saved more than 1.4 million pounds for the, the local health economy. And the, that figure will be even higher now, of course, with their new figures. Nationally, this would have led to 152 million pounds of cost saving. How can we get this in our own service? Well, we need to work in an integrated way with the vascular service and community leg ulcer clinics where these should be managed by specialist nurses with links to community nurses all close to the patient's home and they should have an open referral for uh, all leg ulcers including patient self-referral and it should be assessed and managed as outlined. These sort of clinics can be assessed both in terms of the healing and recurrence rate but also in terms of the a cost effectiveness. And they can have regular quality reviews to ensure that they are carrying out best practice. This can all be rolled out nationally. We need a national leg ulcer strategy. This will reduce the variability that goes on out there, improve outcomes, and we can realize the cost savings that I've, I've just highlighted there. We need to petition the Department of Health. We need a ZAR, a leg ulcer. We need a national clinical director for leg ulceration. And then devolving into leg ulcer networks, with vascular surgeons and community specialist nurses, named accountable clinicians involved, with all these patients being managed in specialist community leg ulcer clinics close to the patient's home. These sort of services can be run along. We have vascular networks already existing for arterial work. There's no reason why those can't become national leg ulcer networks. Thank you. Have we got any questions for Mr. Naimichi? Yeah, one over here, to one over there. Hi, Leanne Atkin, vascular nurse specialist oh, yeah. from Mid York. Hello. Um, we're aware of this. We do it from a vascular world. We have it embedded within community leg ulcer policies in terms of prevention of recurrence, and they will change depending on the next presentation. But the problem seems to be with the commissioners. They seem to block a lot of referrals. They see varicose vein as being a cosmetic procedure even though it's embedded within NICE, even though we know the, what the impact can that be in terms of healing and prevention. So how can we change that commissioner's view? Thank you, Leanne. I was uh, hoping you'd ask that question. Well, there are two approaches. First of all, you, we use the term chronic venous hypertension. Varicose veins has got this, quite rightly, cosmetic appearance to it. But despite that, even in my own area, we hit these blocks. We've got to come from the top. I strongly believe we have, as the societies together have got to petition the Department of Health and it's got to come from the top with direction. And with that, then the commissioners will have to follow it. But going at it from the bottom hasn't worked, as you rightly say. Thank you. Another question. Um, Ewan Radley, University of Leeds. Mine sort of is very similar. I've got to push you even further. <laughs> what we've heard from you in Gloucester, and I know there's other people in the room who are running successful. There's nothing I would disagree with there. It's great. But also, I'm aware there's a lot of people who are not able to get to this. I completely agree. We've got to get from the top. We've been trying to get to the top. We have, I know Alan Davis and I, we've written some very senior people, haven't we? And we're not getting an answer. 
We've started the Legs Matter campaign. We know it's not going to be the total answer. We're bright, so people will see us, but we're near there. How are we going to get to these people at the top? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not expecting you to solve this magically, but yeah. how? I'm not going to solve it magically, <laughs> but I think that having meetings like this where we come along, this is the first time I think the Venus yeah, Forum has really been here. Really welcome you. <laughs> all agreeing together, you coming to our meetings like you did last year, and then all, all of us all coming together to say, doctors, nurses, this is what should be happening. And we've got to start the Department of Health. I strongly believe we've got to get to the top and then get it devolved down. You know, there's no reason why you know, cancer and asthma and diabetes blah, 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 and this dreadful problem. And they, they, of course, answer to money. And these huge potential savings, I'm sure, will actually get recognition. One of the things I'm starting, it's a bit of a spontaneous thought, but is we've, with Legs Matter, we've managed to bring together eight societies in our world. I'm wondering if what we need is a task force where we unite our world, your world. I'm so pleased you're here today. I will be delighted to come and join you in London in June, I think it is. It is. But I'm wondering if what we need is a task force of, to actually try and really focus together. I don't know. Maybe we'll, we could talk, we'll talk about, about it. <laughs> Thank you. We need we need to move on. Sorry, Margaret. Can we we might have some time for questions at the end. Sorry, we need to move on.